So welcome to our talk, New Frontiers in the Detection and Management of Diabetic Retinopathy. My name is Paul Chouse. I'm an optometrist in Tacoma, Washington, and I'm joined today by my uh, terrific, smart, funny colleague, Dr. Craig Thomas. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So these are our financial disclosures for the talk, and we've really done our, our darndest to, to not be biased in terms of the uh, presentation in our program today. These are our overall objectives for this course. We want to talk a bit about the epidemiology and the demographic trends with respect to both diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. And then we'll ask kind of really the fundamental question, right, Craig? You know, what is diabetic retinopathy? Is it more than what we've, you know, been led to believe? What's new for detecting diabetic retinopathy? And once we have detected it, how do we go about assaulting the condition, preventing it from getting worse? and causing vision loss. And then we'll say a few words about prevention and optometry's role in prevention. So here are some of the worldwide statistics for diabetes. You know, right now it's about 460 million people worldwide have the disease. It's going to be above 1 billion by the year 2050. And, you know, the highest incidences are in, uh, the increases are in diabetes and prediabetes are in Asia and sub-Saharan Africa because they're importing, you know, our lifestyle, you know, high, high caloric content, Western diet, uh, high carbohydrate, high sugar, that is a risk factor for diabetes. So I don't, Craig, you know, I see patients with diabetes all the time because I am affiliated with an endocrinology practice. And I would venture to say that, you know, you and your practice are seeing a lot of diabetes on a daily basis. I do. I, it's, it's really striking the change that I've noticed past five, 10 years, uh, and, and I use it as an example, this, this particular day where it just kind of crystallized in my head a few months ago, where I, I come in at seven o'clock in the morning on some days, and this particular day I came in at seven, and my first eight patients of the day all had diabetes. <laughs> I, I, I'm fairly busy, I see about 40 patients a day. I'd say an average day for me is eight to 10 people with diabetes every single day. It's more than glaucoma, it's more than dry eye, it's really more than everything else. Uh, and, and so I think it's time for us to, to pivot a little bit, uh, you know, stop going to glaucoma lectures, stop going to dry eye lectures, and, and let's kind of go where the meat is. Uh, the, 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 the business is in diabetes. This is what the patients are getting. This is where we need to be concentrating on too. Or at least add it to our, our list of top priorities, yeah, two, right? Yeah, yeah add yes. it to what we're already doing. So, you know, for the United States, these are the uh, statistics from the Centers for Disease Control for 2017. More than 30 million people in the U.S. With di uh, that have diabetes, about 7.2 million are undiagnosed. So that's, you know, pretty good, actually, compared to the rest of the world, where it's estimated that as high as half of all people with diabetes worldwide. They actually have the disease now, but they haven't been diagnosed yet. So we're doing better than a lot of places. In addition, there's this whole other group of people that have prediabetes, which is a condition where your blood glucose levels are above normal, but they haven't quite crossed the threshold where you're labeled as diabetes. And I've, I've always thought this is kind of a a strange uh, way to diagnose a disease, right? You cross a certain threshold, suddenly you go from not having it to having it. I mean, we used to say people didn't have glaucoma until their interocular pressure was, you know, above 21, let's say. And now we know that that's not the most accurate way to diagnose the disease, especially early on. You know, I was just thinking of that analogy with the glaucoma patient versus the glaucoma suspect patient and, and how that plays into this so well. Uh, where we've got 30 million people that you know have diabetes. Well, the, the pre-diabetes is the glaucoma suspect, you know, analogy. And the numbers are just ridiculously large. Uh, again, it's, it's what I said just a minute ago. We, practically every optometrist I know goes to two or three glaucoma lectures every year. Uh, we should all be glaucoma experts. 2% of the population has glaucoma. This is 33% of the population either being diabetic or getting ready to be diabetic. I mean, it's no comparison. Yeah. And, and I think we should, should pivot and start to go where the need is. I mean, we don't want people going blind from glaucoma, but there's just as many people going blind from diabetes because the, the group is so much larger. 
No doubt. And, you know, most of these people with prediabetes, if they live long enough, and many of them don't, either they're old when they get prediabetes or their risk of a cardiovascular de demise is much higher. Most of these people, if they live long enough, will end up having the disease. So almost a million and a half people now legally blind in the U.S. from diabetic retinopathy or, or uh, diabetic macular edema uh, that renders them, you know, by definition, legally blind. So these are just the statistics, just a quick graphic to kind of show you the increasing prevalence of diabetes over time. So the general idea here is that as the colors get warmer, darker blue, as it were, uh, rates of diabetes go up. Where the states are flagged as white, no data was available for that particular year about the percentage of the population in each state that has diabetes. So we, if we compare 2015 to 2020, we can see the colors getting warmer. We've got uh, West Virginia there, you know, showing up at, you know, 17 to 18 percent of the total population having diabetes. By 2025, we start getting, you know, Florida and the, the, the predominant part of, you know, uh, the southeastern the south. U.S. The <laughs> south is where the risk is higher. And why is that? Well, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of possible causes. You know, one is that, you know, on, on average, people in the south... Uh, are disproportionately heavier, higher body mass Big index, bigger people, yeah. people uh, perhaps that have higher consumption of calories in general and more, more uh, high carbohydrate, unrefined carbohydrates. It's interesting, another, another study, if you overlay a map of air pollution in the U.S., particulate air pollution over maps of obesity and diabetes, they match up really well. So there is this thought now that, that uh, air pollution stimulates the immune system and maybe leads to attack of the immune system in such a way that it worsens your insulin sensitivity and your insulin hmm. production. Interesting. Yeah. And then we got 2030, you've got more red and places that were blue are you know, becoming yellow now, higher and higher prevalence of diabetes. And look at, go back, look at West Virginia again. 20%. Yeah, 20, 20%. I mean, that's 20%. I mean, I keep going back to the 2% the of the people in the country with glaucoma. I mean, and we all go to 18 glaucoma lectures every year. I mean, here's where the need is. And if you just, if you just look at the cost to our whole economy right now, Medicare dollars, one in three are spent on diabetes. So complications from diabetes are treatment and management of the disease. And, you know, the to total population is about one in six healthcare dollars. So the, the worry is literally it's going to break the bank. Uh, with the increasing prevalence of diabetes. And my mantra is we got to do something not only to prevent eye disease and losing vision from diabetes, but we got to go to the root causes of the disease and try to prevent it. And we'll talk more about that as we move through this talk. Okay. So diabetic retinopathy, uh, the, the stat is about 5% of U.S. adults that have diabetes have a sight-threatening form of the disease. And that's defined as either proliferative diabetic retinopathy or center-involved diabetic macular edema. That is the central retinal subfield, you know, the fovea, the foveola are, are involved. And the biggest cause of vision loss in diabetes is not, you know, bleeding and traction retinal detachment like you get with proliferative disease. It's actually diabetic macular edema. And the biggest risk factor for diabetic macular edema, it's really two of them. It's, it's your, your blood glucose control and how long you've had the disease. And, you know, we're seeing Kids now, Craig, I have, you know, every week I'm seeing at least one patient with type 2 diabetes, morbidly obese, under age 18. So the longer you live with diabetes, the higher the risk of complications. And, and this is really a worrisome trend. The, the rates of type 2 diabetes in children, children and teens, is expected to quadruple in the next 25 years. So that's really a threat. Well, I, you know, I practice in an urban environment in a big city got a lot of, of black and Hispanic patients, and unfortunately, you've got very high obesity rates. I don't see the same number of, of type 2 young people with diabetes as you are, but even, even now, when you see one, it's just kind of weird. Yes. You know, you see some 17-year-old kid who's 100 pounds overweight, and he's already taken metformin. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's so strange, but it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be more common. We better get ready. And, and, you know, there are disparities not only, you know, you're, you're, you're at least twice as likely to get, uh, to get diabetes if you're a person of color 
And you know, you're, you're, less, you're, you're more likely to go blind, less likely to have good metabolic control of your disease if you're a person of color. And there's you know, a whole host of factors for that, but uh, inequalities in the distribution of providers and access to care, that's something that we all have to be concerned about because at the end of the day, we gotta ask ourselves this question, I think. It's fundamental to a democracy. What kind of country do you wanna live in, right? So that, I mean, not to get too political, but we gotta take care of each other. We gotta, we gotta walk in our brother and sister's shoes. Well, I don't know if I want to live in a country where 33% of the people have diabetes, uh, because it's going to affect everybody else. You know, it, 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 again, we're not being political, uh, but it's a real societal problem. And you know, if, if 10 of my neighbors have something wrong with them, eventually it might affect me. You know, and, and maybe. So there's plenty of reason for us to be talking about this, and plenty of reason for optometrists to involve themselves deeper than what we're doing now. We know good blood sugar control is important, but you know it's been shown that there's no level of blood sugar control once you have the disease that is totally protective against diabetic retinopathy. And so, Craig, we've talked about this. You know, I have patients with you know really excellent hemoglobin A1C values who still end up with blinding diabetic retinopathy. And so, it's an important thing to know is that it is beneficial to to improve your blood sugar control, but you know, it, there's no level at which it's totally protective. There are some people that live with the disease for a long time, even with excellent control, that end up with ocular complications of the disease. And these are the ocular complications, right? The, the refractive changes, the glaucoma, cataracts, all the nerve palsies. Uh, I had one uh, just this past week, uh, six nerve palsy, uh, diabetes. Uh, you know, the, the diabetic retinopathy that we're all fixated on trying to, to identify. You know, the past five, 10 years, we've seen all kinds of evidence indicating ocular surface disease is more, more prominent with people with diabetes. Uh, we've all learned, seen, treated, managed patients with, with vitreous hemorrhage, vitreous detachments, retinal detachments, and, and last but not least, these deficits in visual function. Uh, what we comically refer to in my office is, I can't see right. You know, when I ask the patient, Ms. Jones, what can I do for you? Doc, I, I can't see right. I'm like, well, let me help you with that thing. Let me, let me do something about it. Deficits in visual function is actually so common. And again, we're going to show you the stats on it and examples. It's really, to me, in my practice, it's more common than all the other stuff put together, really. So the, that's the bottom line. Exactly right, Craig. I couldn't agree more. You know, diabetes and, and diabetic retinopathy, and this is the case we're going to make, they affect more than just visual acuity. There's a whole bunch of effects on quality of life also. So this is our fundamental question. You know, what is diabetic retinopathy? It sounds like a pretty simple question, right? But I think we've been thinking very narrowly about what diabetes does to the retina and its effects on quality of life. You know, we've all been trained to look for the vascular lesions of diabetic retinopathy. Well, that's because that's what it was. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's the training. That's how we were trained. That's what we were taught. That, that diabetic retinopathy is whatever you can see inside the eye of a person with diabetes. They've got to have some vascular lesions, some microaneurysm, some exudate, uh, some, some area, large area that's easy to see of capillary non-perfusion. That is traditionally, historically, what diabetic retinopathy is. What we know now is that diabetic retinopathy is two things. So it's, it's clearly the the recognition or the observation of these vascular abnormalities, just like we were trained, but it's also this neurodegeneration, and specifically for us as optometrists, retinal neurodegeneration, where you have a loss of the neural elements, the ganglion cells, the nerve fiber layer, the photoreceptors, and these losses, these structural damage, produces a loss of visual function. And it's just like when we give all of our glaucoma lectures and we talk about structure function, structure function relationships, if something, if you got a structural abnormality, are you going to have a corresponding loss of visual function? In diabetes, what we see, and we're going to get into it in a minute, is that you can have one connected to the other, but they can be totally independent and parallel of each other, where you can have a patient that has the microvascular component, where you see things, but you can also have the same patient that may or may not have the neurodegeneration component. They are not connected directly. It's a big thing to understand, but there's two things going on. One is bleeding in the eye, and the other is nerve damage, neural damage. Two separate things, both of them diabetes-induced, and both of them are diabetic retinopathy. Yes, and you know, it's interesting. It, it, there's been an argument for some time that 
the neural damage, the neurodegenerative uh, aspect of diabetes occurs prior to the development of the vascular lesions. You know, one interesting animal model uh, at the University of uh, Indiana University showed that in animals, at least, if you get rid of the rods and cones, which are really, you know, they're, they're not vascularized, they are neural elements, uh, even if the blood glucose levels are above 1,000, you know, crazy high levels of blood glucose, that there are, that even though if you leave the vascular in, vasculature intact, uh, diabetic retinopathy lesions simply don't develop. You actually need the, uh, the neurodegeneration to occur prior to the development of the vascular lesions. But the two, exactly as you said, can occur simultaneously or one, you one, know, after, the other. one after the other. Yeah. Typically, I, so, you know, my question to you would be, do, have you seen patients with severe vascular retinopathy caused by diabetes that don't have retinal diabetic neuropathy type changes? No. 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 I mean, you're going to find, you're going to find these deficits in visual function. And that's what the neurodegenerative aspect of the disease causes. You're going to find them virtually in every case a patient with severe vascular disease as a function of their diabetes. And of course, our goal is optometrists, right? We're supposed to be the primary eye care prevention uh, profession. We're all about prevention. And we want to catch these things early on so we can hopefully intervene earlier. So the, the point here is that diabetic retinopathy is not just this stuff. It's not just dot and blot hemorrhages and hard exudates and, you know, diabetic macular edema you, you see here on an OCT with hard exudates and the like. It's not just this stuff. It's also this stuff. Visual deficits. Loss Color of, vision, yeah. contrast, the visual field defects, dark adaptometry, abnormal electrodiagnostic test results. It's, it's every, I would almost challenge anybody, is there some type of visual function thing that we can measure that's not affected by diabetes? Is there even one that's not affected? You know, visual acuity can be affected. Visual field can be affected. Retinal sensitivity, the color vision can be affected. The person's contrast sensitivity can be affected. Their dark adaptation response can be affected. Their response to an ERG or a VEP could be affected. Is there any one visual function measurement that cannot be affected by diabetes? I think I don't the answer is so. no. <laughs> yeah, really. And it, we, we put up a, uh, you know, a frequency doubling technology, an FDT perimetry uh, uh, image here, just to, to make the point, there is actual research out there that shows that FDT perimetry is more sensitive to changes in diabetes than is standard white-on-white uh, -white perimetry. And, and I think the big thing, I, I don't know if we're going to get into heavy detail with the visual fields, most of us have been trained to kind of default to a 30-2 visual field test protocol or a 24-2. Those tests are too gross to pick up early changes. And you need to use a 10-2 if you're going to do a regular perimetry test. Or again, what the research shows is the frequency doubling technology is way more sensitive to early damage uh, in patients with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to do the, t the right test the right way to see what's going on. So you could do a 30-2 visual field test. That thing may be totally normal. You do a 10-2 or a frequency doubling and you see all kind of stuff. It's exact, and it's exact, you know, with Plaquenil uh, maculopathy, not something we all see every day, but you know, a 24-2 is gonna miss a lot of that because the stimulus, the separation between the stimuli is too wide. And on a 10-2, it's more compact. You're more likely to pick up on these sorts of deficits. That's a, just a great point. And dark adaptation, we alluded to, uh, is affected by diabetes and, and contrast sensitivity. That's the example there on the lower left part of the screen. So diabetic retinopathy. You know, this is a, a, a slide I developed uh, in, in conjunction with the reference at the bottom of the slide, where you've got diabetes as your core base disease, and it, it basically gives off these side effects. So if you see in the upper right box the, the retinal vasculopathy, microaneurysms and all that stuff, that's what we've been fixated on 98% of the time, trying to determine, does my patient have retinal vasculopathy secondary to diabetes, yes or no? And we, we look inside the eye and we try to make that differentiation, yes or no. But it's three other things, and we hear about them, especially the ones at the bottom, I hear it all the time. Uh, but but if, you know, specifically to the eye component, you see the box in the upper left has retinal neurodegeneration, and, and you see these the, the loss of the neural elements there. If you look at the bottom, 
the generalized neurodegeneration. And, and again, the, the biggest thing I hear in my practice all day long, every week, every month, I have some person with diabetes. I was going to say an old lady, but it doesn't have to be an old lady. It could be anybody. Anybody that's had diabetes for a few years or more. And I'll say, hey, how do you feel? Uh, what do you mean, doc? I said, do you have any, and I have to be specific. I'll have to ask specific questions. Uh, do you have any tingling in your fingers or tingling in your toes? And they go, yeah, I do sometimes. You know, I said, does it hurt? Does it get numb? And they'll, you know, I'll kind of ask about it. Well, if they say yes to any of those questions, they are telling me that they have generalized neurodegeneration. It's starting in the brain, affecting the autonomic nervous system and going into the peripheral nerves. Well, if they've got generalized neurodegeneration, I think it is very likely and highly probable that they can have retinal neurodegeneration. The way that I detect retinal neuro neurodegeneration is by functional vision assessment. So I start running tests to see if they have any retinal neurodegeneration when they've already told me that they have generalized neurodegeneration. That's not a really big reach, and I don't think I'm being ethically challenged or, or doing stuff that's inappropriate when I start running tests to see if people have stuff wrong with them. Uh, you see the, the box on the bottom right, the generalized vasculopathy, brain, heart, renal stuff. We've all had just goo gobs of patients with diabetes with heart problems, kidney problems, they're on dialysis, uh, they've had 10 strokes. I mean, just it's ridiculous sometimes. Well, if the person tells me that they're on dialysis and they've had a stroke last year, so they've got generalized vasculopathy, it's pretty likely and very probable they've got retinal vasculopathy. These things all go together, and although they're not directly related to each other, there is an indirect correlation in relationship, and when you get one, it's a lot easier to get the second one. And when you get the second one, you almost guaranteed to get the third. And if you got three, man, that fourth one's right around the corner. And so these are the things you gotta, you gotta look at the big picture, not just focus on that retinal vasculopathy up in the upper right side. You gotta look at everything, the whole person, the eyeballs and the body. The eyes are connected to a human being that has other body parts. That's exactly right. I just wanted to make a comment about the lower left box there, generalized neurodegeneration. You know, we know now that diabetes is a major risk factor for neurodegeneration that leads to cognitive decline. Both Alzheimer's and non-Alzheimer's dementia rates are two to four times higher in people with diabetes. In fact, Alzheimer's disease is now called type 3 diabetes because there is a loss of insulin production and sensitivity within patients' brains uh, at, at the outset of the disease. And that's incredible. That's some new science there. New, new science. Yeah. So how are we going to detect you know, these changes early on, right? So for the vascular component, right, we've all been trained extensively in this, and this is a, you know, what we do on a daily basis, which is to really do a careful dilated eye exam. The, thing that, the new kind of caveat is we can't just look at the posterior pole. We have to look at the peripheral retina, that patients get lesions there as well. But other you know, more sophisticated ways that detecting vascular disease caused by diabetes is with OCT and OCT angiography. Multispectral imaging, which unfortunately is not currently available in the US, but Craig and I both think that it's gonna come back shortly. The other way to do it is, you know, the peripheral retina I just alluded to is important to take uh, some wide field retinal images and we've got some great instrumentation to do that now. Another thing that kind of crosses over between retinal vasculopathy and neuropathy is macular pigment optical density. We know low macular pigment. That is, it's lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin in the macula. If you have low levels of these, you're way more likely to develop diabetes and more likely to develop more severe diabetic retinopathy. And then we move on into the tests that are maybe more specific for retinal neurodegeneration. We've listed a few of the ones here that we think are important. Uh, Electroretinography, uh, electro contrast sensitivity, threshold color contrast vision, and threshold perimetry, uh, particu particularly with frequency doubling technology, or 10-2, as Craig was saying earlier. So peripheral diabetic retinopathy, is it important? So a lot of us have heard of this already, but I just want to kind of speak to it again, which is that a Joslin Diabetes Clinic study published a couple years ago now showed that patients that had more traditional diabetic retinopathy, vascular lesions, more of this in the peripheral retina than they do in the posterior pole. 
what's called the seven standard fields that were used on standardized seven field color fundus photography. So if you have more of these peripheral diabetic retinopathy lesions than you do central lesions, those patients were dramatically more likely to develop site-threatening diabetic retinopathy, particularly proliferative diabetic retinopathy, like five times more likely to get PDR. So now there is a protocol being done by the Diabetic Retinopathy Clinical Research Network, or DRCR.net. It's called Protocol AA, and they're trying to replicate this finding. We misspelled protocol, forgive me. We found three words so far we misspelled, so we're, we really are at least quasi-literate individuals. <laughs> <laughs> but that this protocol is trying to actually determine, is, does, does peripheral retinopathy, in fact, predict visual outcomes, so long-term vision loss, and then the need for needing, uh, you know, uh, destructive therapies like photocoagulation or more, you know, invasive techniques like anti-VEGF therapy. And they're also looking at things like renal disease and cardiovascular disease. Does peripheral retinopathy uh, predict that as well? So this is, this is an area of ongoing interest and research. So here's just an example of a patient uh, captured with an ultra-wide field image from Optos, and there's multiple companies now that have the ability to take wide field imaging. Optos is great because you can take a single image, but you know, Claris, which is from Zeiss, and Aiden, which is another wide field camera, just by taking a couple of shots, you can get really quite far out into the periphery. Here's an example of a patient that has more peripheral retinopathy than central retinopathy, right? And yeah, I was going to ask you, Paul, what, how do you define posterior pole in this image? So the posterior pole is the standardized seven uh, fundus fields that were, that were implemented as part of the ETDRS study. So it basically it goes you know, up to the superior and inferior arcades, a couple of disc diameters nasal to the optic nerve, and a couple of disc diameters kind of temporal to where the foveola is. So if, you, if you're using the arcades as your boundary, then you're, the majority of the lesions are, are peripheral to that. Exactly. And so this would be a patient, and really the importance of this is, well, you want to counsel the patient to get better metabolic control, but also this is a patient you want to see more frequently. So if you see a patient like this, you don't say, you know, you see a few microaneurysms in the posterior pole, you might say, oh, it's not that bad, come back in a year. But if you look at the peripheral retina or image it and scrutinize it, you're going to have this patient come back more frequently because they're five times more likely to develop PDR and about three times more likely to have a significant worsening of their retinopathy. So this is a patient with this profile that I'm seeing back in three to four months. And that's better for the patient. It's better for your practice. It's better for public health and for saving money in the long run. So you're going to keep people from losing eyesight because they are not being followed at appropriate intervals. So detecting vasculopathy. We, we, you know, Paul just talked about using the wide field with kind of a panoramic feature of, of detecting especially trying to pick up those 30% of the lesions that are in the periphery. But still, you know, we start at the posterior pole. Uh, I've got an image here, again, of the, it's a multispectral image, uh, which unfortunately, again, we can't really get to right now. But for the, for the sake of the lecture, uh, you know, we've got the image of the retina here. And I use the yellow wavelength to highlight vascular lesions. And if you look at the image real close, uh, you can see a few microaneurysms superior to the macula. There's some exudates way out in the periphery, right on the edge of the arcade. And so the, the, the way we detect vasculopathy is we look in the eye, either with a dilated fundus exam or, or the wide field imaging. But what we're, what we're looking at with these technologies, or again with an ophthalmoscope, is what's called clinical retinopathy. And that goes by the, the guidelines and the definitions that we're using from the study from 28 years ago. Uh, you know, where it set up all these, these classifications and terms that we use now. That's the early treatment of diabetic retinopathy study. The EDTRS, yeah. Yeah, okay. ETDRS, yeah, right. Yes, and we all, practically every one of us uh, has some form that we've adapted from those guidelines and findings where we examine our patient, uh, dilate them up. If we don't see anything in the eye, then we check off two boxes. They don't have any apparent retinopathy. They don't have any clinically significant macular edema. We tell the patient they're okay. We send the form to the PCP, and then we pat each other on the back and say, see you next year. Okay, that's what we've been doing for years. Well, the technology exists now where we can detect vascular lesions. We're, we're talking about detecting retinal vasculopathy. We can detect these vascular lesions at what is called a subclinical level, 
which is a which to me, you know, kind of in a base sense means I can't see it with an ophthalmoscope. Uh, the fact that I can see it with this technology, does that really mean it's subclinical? You know, if I can see it with this machine and I can't see it with that, is it clinical or subclinical? Well, since we're going by 28-year-old definitions and guidelines, clinical retinopathy is what you can see with your ophthalmoscope. Subclinical retinopathy is what you cannot see with your ophthalmoscope. And what we know, based on, on just practical experience, the, the articles that we've all read, my own personal experience, is that there's just so many patients that have subclinical retinopathy if you have the technology and if you know what you're looking for and what you're looking at. And so to really get into this and, and do the best job you can, you've got to have an OCT. I mean, it, I, I just don't know how you could take care of people with diabetes without an OCT. I mean, it could be done. I don't want to you know, demean or, or belittle anybody that doesn't have an OCT yet. But if you're, if you're interested enough in the topic to be listening to us right now and you don't have an OCT, I mean, the first recommendation I'm going to tell you is you've got to go get an OCT. I don't care where you get one. I don't care how much it costs. Go, go get them on eBay, whatever. Get an old one. Get a, get a boat anchor one. But get one because it's going to show you stuff you can't see any other way. Then if you can really kick it up a notch, you add the angiography component, the OCTA retinal imaging. That's going to fundamentally change the way that you take care of people with diabetes, and I mean fundamentally change it. Right now, in 2018, nobody can buy a multispectral imaging unit unless you're in China, so we're not going to talk about that too much. And it's been a long time since I've seen an optometrist do intravenous fluorescein angiography, so I'm not going to talk about that too much. Let's talk about the stuff we can do, which is the OCT and the OCTA. And I think you make a great point about, you know, the importance of OCT and emerging, increasing importance of OCTA. And, and I would just like to call on all our colleagues, if you don't have it, get it if you can, but also think about working with optometric colleagues in your community that are willing to let patients be sent to them for the imaging. You can interpret it. They can hold you through the process and teach you, and you can, you can share patients and technology. So I think optometrists can collaborate together, save costs on some of these expensive technologies. It, it's not a total barrier, even if you don't have this technology immediately in your office. Think about partnering with a colleague. It doesn't have to be an ophthalmologist. If you have a friendly retina specialist that is willing to do it, or a co-management center that does cataract surgeries and whatnot, that's great. But think about partnering up with your own colleagues. I think we don't refer to one another enough. And some of us in optometry, we all know this, we don't have credentialed specialization, but we have practical specialization within the profession. And by that, I mean, you know, some people just do nothing but contact lenses. That's the predominant mode of their practice. Other people do lots of glaucoma, lots of retinal disease. My practice is almost exclusively diabetes. So think about developing specialties that you can collaborate with other optometrists in your community. I could not agree more, and, and I have a lot of experience with that. Uh, I've always kind of been a tech guy, and, and most of the optometrists within 10, 15 miles of my practice know that, and I've received quite a few referrals through the years from my optometric brothers and sisters. Uh, the ones that don't, they're scared of me. They're scared I'm going to take the patient. They're scared that the patient's going to like my office better than the, than the office they came from, and it's really a problem. Uh, and and we have not maximized it because of that. Yeah, so uh, we so got to get past it. What it's, I'm telling for the patient. Yeah. What I'm telling. I've had patients say to me, you know, Dr. Smith, whomever sent me to your office, and I'm here. Can I be your patient now? And I say, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. You were referred by a colleague. He does a or she does a wonderful job. I'm just helping them do a better job. I'm I'm going to be consulting with your primary care eye doctor, and we're going to work together collaboratively. So that's one possible See, way. See, I've, I've had it the exact opposite. I, I say I would rather not do that, but I work for you. And you, this is a free country, and if you want me to be your eye doctor, I'm not going to tell you no, because you're just going to go someplace else if I don't do it. Uh, so it's, it's, I don't have the right answer. No, I, I'm, yeah. I'm just saying, you know, gen, you know if, if, you, if patients, if a large number of patients migrate from somebody else's practice to yours, after that patient has been referred, that's probably not. Well, they're generally going to stop those referrals. Yeah, they're going to stop those <laughs> referrals, right? So you try not to do that. <laughs> so multispectral imaging, yeah, again, it went to, so the only reason we brought it up is we, we hope it comes back to the U.S., but it, it's a, a longer wavelength uh, scanning laser ophthalmoscope that can show you, you know, the subclinical 
really unobservable microaneurysms. You can't really even see them that well on fluorescein angiography or OCTA. And what's been shown by a study done by uh, two of our optometric colleagues, Kerry Gelb and Stuart Richer, they showed that using this technology, that insulin resistance was highly correlated with subclinical microaneurysm formation in patients without diagnosed diabetes. So this is very interesting. So they actually, they didn't just look at blood sugar and whether you've been diagnosed with diabetes. They actually measured fasting and two-hour postprandial insulin levels. And they did an oral glucose tolerance test or an OGTT. That's what pregnant ladies get, you know, to determine if they have gestational diabetes. You drink a big glass of sugar water, basically. You hang out in the office for a few hours and they check your blood glucose at various intervals. So you're trying to provoke hyperglycemia. So when they looked at insulin levels and patients that are insulin resistant, they may have normal blood glucose levels, but their insulin levels are sky high. These are people that are going to get diabetes ultimately. They're also way more likely to get heart disease, what's called the metabolic syndrome. They're much more likely to develop cancer. So we think that uh, multispectral imaging gives us as eye care providers an opportunity to identify patients with insulin resistance syndrome or the metabolic syndrome long before they are diagnosed clinically by their PCP or even the typical endocrinologist that is not evaluating anything other than their blood glucose levels typically fasting or their hemoglobin A1C. And by the time a patient's diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, it's been at least six years since they've actually had the disease. So we're diagnosing the disease very late. And the reason is we're only relying on these couple of metrics of blood glucose. We're not looking at insulin production and insulin sensitivity because it's more expensive, takes more time. I don't know about you, Craig, but PCPs and endocrinologists are telling me they're already overwhelmed. They don't want to know if another 25 million people actually have <laughs> diabetes because they can barely you know, deal with the patients they have coming into their offices. But if it's your mom or dad or brother or sister, you, know, you want to know early on because once you got diabetes, your risk of complications, including dying early at a young age from diabetes goes way up. And you know, about 60% of all deaths you know, in people under the age of 60 that are not related to an accident or an injury are associated with diabetes. 60%? 60%, so wow. a high number. Wow. And that's, worldwide, that's a worldwide statistic. Mm -hmm. So here's just an example of a patient that had multispectral imaging at this specific wavelength. And you can see circled here the subclinical microaneurysm formation. This is a patient without diagnosed diabetes. And actually, if you do the blood glucose testing, they're going to be in the normal or pre-diabetes range, but they've got these lesions that show they've got insulin resistance. So it's another way maybe we as eye care providers can give, you know, primary care physicians some early insight into patients that need to be watched more closely and counseled more rigorously to prevent the disease. There's the citation for the paper that Drs. Uh, Gelb and Richer and Cheryl Zimmer is an optometrist as well as is Jerry Sherman. Jeffrey Gold is an internal medicine doc uh, in the northeast of the U.S. that partnered with this group on this particular paper. Really phenomenally important work in my opinion. So how about OCT? Is it, is it good for monitoring diabetic macular edema? I think it's great for diagnosing it. The stat is that something like 30% of people that have diabetic macular edema are not detected by stereo fundoscopy performed by retina specialists, okay? So retina specialists tell me now, the first thing I do before I see the patient, if they've got diabetes, I want an OCT, I want wide field imaging, I wanna know what's going on. I don't even have to see the patient after that. I know if they need treatment or not. And I was joking with one of the uh, retina speakers yesterday that you know, they have to be told by their office staff you know, the patient wants to talk to you. I don't need to see the patient. They just need to be injected and schedule them for an injection. But patients <laughs> actually want some hands-on care, right? So, Well, you know, the, again, I've, we've mentioned it already once or twice. It is most difficult to provide modern eye care for a patient with diabetes without some type of OCT technology. Uh, it, it shows you the vascular component. It shows you the neurodegenerative component. It's the only technology that does both. Yes. You know, really. And so the, the photos here just depict, you know, obvious DME, but there's somebody that's much more subtle on the bottom, has, you know, clinically non-detectable uh, diabetic macular edema. If you just relied on a stereo fundus exam, which has been the gold standard, that's what the ETDRS used, 
Uh, the OCT is picking up these areas of cystic change. And patients that have this are not going to be treated. This patient's 2020. If it doesn't involve the foveal center and their vision's good, they're not treated. But they need to be watched more closely because they're about triply, triply likely, three times more likely, to develop clinically significant macular edema that actually threatens their visual acuity. OCTA, the difference. You know, what's the difference between the OCTA and the OCT? Uh, and you guys can read the slides. I don't need to read the slide to you. The OCTA is measuring blood flow, the movement of the, the uh, red blood cells through the vessels. That's what it's doing. We don't need to get into the science of it. What it allows you to do, though, is, again, see stuff that you can't see any other way. And once you, it won't take long. It took me a couple of months. Uh, once, you, once you get into it and learn about what you're looking at, the, the, the information is simply incredible. Uh, you know, it, it may take you five, ten minutes to go through the printout because there's so much information there, but it's so valuable. Uh, again, I, I said if, if you don't have an OCT, okay, go get one. If you got an OCT, get an OCTA. Uh, if you got enough money, just get an OCTA, <laughs> you know, period. I mean, it's, it's top-of-the-line care. And, again, I, I, I don't want to, you know, demean anybody or, or put anybody down, but in my opinion, it is most difficult to render the best care to a person with diabetes or diabetic retinopathy if you do not have OCTA technology. Uh, you're going to have a, uh, I don't know if it's coming up on a, a slide coming up, but you're going to have an increased capture rate. It changes everything. It changes everything. And I think we got a clinical, clinical image coming up next, Craig, that we can just show our audience. Here's what I was talking about. Yes, exactly. So th this is actually my staff, my patient, my office, my machine. And, and you see the abnormalities that you find in diabetes on this bottom section with the little bullets, the, the remodeling of the capillaries, the dropout in the retina, microaneurysms, enlargement of the foveal avascular zone. Okay, I've had this OCTA instrument for 15 months. 16 months ago, I didn't know what enlargement of the foveal avascular zone meant because I couldn't see it. Why would I care about something I can't see? I never worried about macular telangiectasia. You know, I, I couldn't figure that out. I'd have to do a fluorescein angiogram to figure that out. So, you know, I could know what it is in a, in a, in a book, but without the, 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 the corresponding hands-on, it just doesn't mean anything. And if you go to the top of the slide, the clinical benefits, this is the big deal. So you've got 36% of patients. This is a study I got out of Review of Optometry uh, printed last year. 36% of the patients with no clinical retinopathy. So I can't see anything. I've dilated them up, BIO, direct ophthalmoscope, everything. I can't see a thing. White light, fundus photography. I got a fancy fundus camera. I don't see nothing, OK? Let's say you've got 100 patients with diabetes. You dilate up 100 eyeballs and look in there, and you don't see a thing. If you've got one of these OCTA technologies, 36% of the time, you're going to find something wrong with them. They're going to either have this, this enlargement of the foveal avascular zone, or they'll have capillary non-perfusion that you can only see doing an intravenous fluorescein, if you can see it that way. And that's an if. Uh, this technology is actually more accurate uh, because it's, it's multidimensional as opposed to the fluorescein being two-dimensional. This is three-dimensional. And, and so you're seeing more. You're seeing the same thing that intravenous fluorescein shows you, but more. So think about, you know, from a practical point of view, you've got a, those, that same 100 patients with diabetes if you treat them like we've been treating them, like I was treating them uh, up until 15 months ago. So I, I, I have that 100 patients. I dilate them up, look in there, don't see a thing. I tell the patient they're okay. I tell their medical doctor. I send the report, these reports we fill out, these 28-year-old reports that we fill out. And I tell the medical doctor there's nothing wrong with the patient. Well, if you don't have this OCTA technology, up to 36% of the time, you're wrong. You're making the incorrect diagnosis. You're telling the patient they're okay when they're not. You're telling the medical doctor that our mutual patient is okay when they're not. You, so without the technology, you now run the risk of making the incorrect diagnosis, and everything flows from that. So if, if you go left instead of right, you're always going to be on the wrong road no matter what you do. So it's, you know, you've got to get on the right road. This technology lets you get on the right road and stay on it. I mean, that's a big deal. Uh, it, it's so important to understand that 36% number it changes everything. You know, without the technology, up to 36% of the time, you're making the wrong diagnosis. That is not what we should be doing. We're better than that. We've got technology that lets us be better than that. You got to buy it. It's not cheap, but it's, it's so much better. It's better care. And 
for me, the better care I deliver, really the more money I make and the more fun I have. They all go together. So these areas of non you know, clearly it's important if you're picking up on things like un undetected neovascularization, which OCTA allows you to do by looking at the vitreo-retinal interface. You know, what's the significance of retinal non-perfusion? Well, you know, that's ischemia. Exactly. These are patients way more <laughs> likely to get neovascularization. They need to be monitored more closely. So there are features of this technology that not only say, okay, I got to intervene more aggressively now because my patient's not normal, but this patient needs to be followed up at more regular intervals than they would have otherwise. And, and Paul, on the, the capillary non-perfusion aspect, you know, I'm pretty famous in my office for playing Jedi mind tricks on my patients as long as I don't hurt them. And so let's say I find some, some capillary non-perfusion that I did not expect to find. And so I'll, I'll put the picture up on the big flat screen, explain everything, what's going on. And then I'll say, Ms. Jones, I gotta tell you, you know, this, this test that we did today shows that the, the retinal microcirculation is abnormal. So the, the blood flow in your eye is abnormal. It's not right. It's possible that you might have abnormal blood flow in other parts of your body, maybe in your kidney, maybe in your heart, maybe in your brain. You know, I heard your sister had a stroke last month. You know, there might be other stuff going on. We need to keep looking. This thing's like a bird dog, you know, and it's giving me a point. And I, I still got to finish it, but I got to have a bird dog to hurt, hunt birds. <laughs> okay, you know. And, and ju in this, you know, not to be too politically incorrect, but I've found that for men in particular, you know, this vascular issue with non-perfusion. You can go. I, I, I told you that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I had to bring it on home. I, I'm, <laughs> I, I see men's eyes dilate before the first drop of trypicamide or phenylephrine hits, hits their cornea when I tell them that erectile dysfunction is linked to their diabetic retinopathy. And we've all seen, we've all had patients that, you know, that we have a good relationship with that will mention that to us. Uh, I've lost count of it in my 34 years of practice. And you're right, but you're talking about going Jedi mind trick on somebody. You go, you, you bring that up to a man, uh, he'll, he'll perk up and pay attention to what you're saying. The two are linked <laughs> to each other. Men will yeah. pay attention. Now, for women, it may work as well. I just haven't gone down that road yet. Because <laughs> as it turns out, you know, sexual dysfunction really common in both men and women in yeah. diabetes. Really? Something to be aware of. Wow, yep. okay. So here's a patient that's had type 1 diabetes 10 years, dilated the patient, couldn't see a thing. And I try to do an exquisite, you know, comprehensive dilated eye exam. 2015 vision, actually patient had minimal non-proliferative retinopathy, I apologize. But what we're seeing here, especially at the deep capillary plexus, so we're deeper down in the retina, is areas of non-perfusion, more microaneurysms are being mm -hmm. highlighted there. And that, maybe that big one there that lights up like a, like a Christmas light, you know, I, I saw in clinical exam, but there's, there's a whole bunch of other areas there we've got microaneurysm formation. And this is what OCTA is very sensitive at detecting, and I think multispectral imaging even more sensitive. You know, and if this is the same patient, Look at the foveal avascular zone difference between the deep plexus and the superficial. They're not the same. They are not. And they should be the same. They should, I mean, there's three or four abnormalities there. That person's going to have 20-10 vision. They have clinically significant diabetic retinopathy, and it's going to get worse if we don't intervene and do something. So these are the uh, OCTA findings that have been linked in research to the progression of diabetic retinopathy and the likelihood of, of getting worse retinopathy. And Craig just mentioned one of them, which is increased foveal avascular zone size. And so one of the metrics now in studies is to look and see if with any therapy, we can prevent enlargement of the foveal avascular zone in diabetes. The other thing that happens is that blood flow is decreased. You get less blood flow into the eye, especially in this deep capillary plexus. And this was highly predictive of somebody getting worse diabetic retinopathy. Vascular retinopathy is the, the size of the FAZ, reduced blood vessel density, and blood flow. See, that, again, Paul, that, I mean, the terminology we're using right now, you know, where we're, we're having specificity where an abnormality in the superficial capillary plexus is less significant than an abnormality in the deep capillary plexus. I'm telling you, a year and a half ago, you'd have been speaking Latin to me. But once I got the technology, and I had to read up on it. It took me two, three months to figure this stuff out. They didn't teach us this in optometry school. No. Okay, and, it, it, and it's coming out in our literature, but you know, the early literature was all in the ophthalmology journals. 
But I mean, when you get your head into this stuff and see the, the information and what it's telling you, it's really incredible what we can do now. It's so different. So, so OCTA doesn't show you dye leakage. It just shows you where blood is actually flowing. And so, it, it, you know, it's color coded. So the, the reddish orange image there, those are the super superficial blood vessels. That's what lights up with the fluorescein angiogram. And FA is not going to show the green areas below, which are in the deep capillary plexus. So this is stuff that FA is not going to show unless there's leakage from those capillaries deeper down. And that's really the only benefit to intravenous fluorescein angiography compared to this technology is the leakage. Leakage. It's now, the only benefit. Now, leakage is important because leakage, it's important. that's what retina specialists treat. If there's but you know, leakage, I can't do that yet. No. So I'm going to let that go and do these other five things. I'm just concentrate on what I can do. I can do this. Absolutely. Here, you've got an OCT image. And, and, and this is another example where for years and years and years, I mean, I hate to admit it, but it's the truth. You know, I didn't know what I was looking at. And I, I consider myself at least average. You know, so, And I'm like, man, if I don't know what's happening, you know, what about everybody else? So I put this scan up here of a regular OCT image. You know, this is just a normal OCT image off of Cirrus OCT. And you see the part at the bottom where it says retinal diabetic neuropathy, RDN, manifest on the OCT as significant thinning. So what I wanted to show you, does this advance? So interretinal thinning and diabetes. So what you have, and, and this, the, these factoids are incredible. So when you find retinal diabetic neuropathy, the thinning of the, the retina, interretinal layer, You've got a four to 10 times increased risk of cardiovascular problems. You've got stroke, heart attack, two, three times increase. I mean, that's a big deal. And what I would see is I would see images like this with, the, with this retinal thinning that you see on the ganglion cell complex, or even, I don't know if we have it on the, in this particular slide. There's one where the whole image is, is depressed. The retina just yeah, thins out. Just thins out. The, and, I, and it's the inner retina. It's not yeah. the outer retina and diabetes. The and inner I, retina I used to see out. that and not understand what I was looking at. So I'd look at it, and, and we're, you know, we were, we're fixated, just like we're fixated on looking for retinal vasculopathy, and no one's looking for retinal neurodegeneration. When we're looking for the vasculopathy, and in particular with an OCT scan, we're always looking for increased thickness. Macular edema. Is the macular swollen? Do they have clinically significant macular edema? It's the number one cause of blindness. You better find that out. So we're trying to see if it's thicker, thicker, thicker. Is it anywhere where it's thicker? Well, in 18% of the people with diabetes, it's going to be thinner. And it's going to be from hypoxia, or what the old people call post-circulation. You know, they got that post-circulation. And I used to see that years ago. I mean, I got my first OCT like seven, eight, nine years ago. And again, they didn't teach us this stuff. It's not in the book. <clears throat> and I'd, I'd see the, the, the sector plot where you want your sector plot to be green, where the retinal thickness is normal. If it's pink, you know, it's showing elevation. Well, what if it's red and it's showing atrophy? I would be getting mad at my staff. Don't do that test again. That's not right. You know, that, that, you didn't do it right. And they said, Don Thomas, I did it right. <laughs> you know, and, and I'd make them do it again. And now I know, I'm almost, almost sheepishly, what I was looking at it was this retinal thinning. And until I started lecturing with Dr. Chouse, I didn't understand the clinical significance. And I mean the big time clinical significance, where it's not just an eye thing. You know, you got a two to three fold increase in stroke and heart attacks and death. Okay, most of my patients will perk up when I start talking like that. And, you know, the PCP should perk up, so should the endocrinologist. But what I've found, my biggest referral base using OCTA to demonstrate retinal thinning is with the cardiologist. If the patient has any sort of heart disease and if they've got diabetes, they're on their road to heart disease even if it's not manifest yet. The cardiologists are interested in this. I'm getting a lot, about half of my new referrals now coming from cardiology. So it's just, it's, an, it's a practice management tip, but start thinking about sending these letters to the multiple providers that your patients see. Because the cardiologists, they're not fighting you. They're not, I have had, cardiologist calling me, I didn't realize that optometrists, first of all, knew so much about, you know, diabetes and, a, and about these subtle manifestations of diabetes in the eye. And I'm really impressed with the literature citation because that's what I'm doing in my report. I'm citing this particular study now saying, you know, look it up yourself. <laughs> well, that makes, I mean, what did I just say? I've been practicing 34 years. Up until a year and a half ago, I had zero awareness of these facts. Zero. That's why we're doing this lecture. 
And not every doc is going to buy in and like this and want you to see their patients because you're too much of a pain in the ass, right? <laughs> for, for, but you know who's going to care? The patient and good physicians are going to care because they, they know the patient works for any healthcare provider. And we're in this collaboratively. That's the whole thing with diabetes. It's really a team approach. We all got to work together to get the best outcomes. Now, we know, and this is a function of retinal diabetic neuropathy, which is RDN, and that's a term that's being used now in ophthalmology journals, that RDN affects visual function. You know, what we rely on in an eye exam, most of us, is 100% contrast visual acuity. These optotype charts, right, where you've got letters of decreasing size, but it's 100% contrast, black on white. That technology is old, right? It's been around <laughs> for more than a century. We got to think about using, we're supposed to be measuring vision. Think about things that are more subtle, like patients' contrast sensitivity or their color perception. And I'm not talking about an Ishihara plate or even a D15. I'm talking about new technologies that allow us to precisely identify the functioning of the short, medium, and long wavelength cones in the eye. The red, green, and blue cones, that is highly correlated with diabetes. So you can't forget that diabetes impairs visual function, and we already alluded to this earlier, visual field gets mucked up, and so do patients' ability to see at night. So patients come in, tell you they're having trouble driving at night, especially if they have diabetes. But in any case, it's worth considering running a dark adaptation curve on these folks, and there's great clinical instrumentation now. It's covered by Medicare, and you know- It's, it's covered a, by everybody. It's covered by everybody now. And so it's a, it's a way, not only great for diabetes, also plays a significant role for age-related macular degeneration, especially in its early identification. Paul, I want to go back just a second to the OCT. <clears throat> I remember one time you asked me, you know, would you ever consider performing or ordering an OCT scan as a screening test on every patient with diabetes? You know, do you, do you have to wait for a clue? Do you have to wait for an abnormal finding? Uh, I, I, you know, that, to me, inquiring minds want to know. My answer is, Yes, I have considered it, and yes, I do it. And I don't worry about the billing and the coding and uh, what if I don't find anything, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna do what everybody else should do. I'm gonna charge the patient, okay? I mean, we're not, again, it's not a practice management lecture, but optometrists have been conditioned since first year optometry school to sell glasses. Uh, not a single person listening to this lecture, I think, would have a problem recommending an anti-reflection coating to a patient that had enough money to buy one. Uh, they would have no problem recommending a transitions lens to a patient that had enough money to buy one. Why do we have problems recommending the $50 OCT scan if the patient came in ready to buy something? Uh, it, 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 you know, it's, it doesn't make any sense. We're hurting ourselves, we're limiting ourselves. If the patient has enough money to buy an $800 pair of glasses, They've got enough money to spend $50 on an OCT scan so I can try to see if there's something wrong with them. And if I find something on this OCT or an OCTA, then everything else is billable, reportable, medically necessary. So I, I may charge them $50 to see if there's something wrong with them, but then I'll bill their insurance $400 to see how bad it is. So we, we can't get, if we go by the 28-year-old technology, or, or not technology, guidelines, where we gotta see something to think something's wrong with them, then you're not gonna find stuff. You're gonna miss stuff up to 36% of the time. So we've got to, I think, take a, a leap forward where you know, the, the guidelines I use in my office, and I, I kind of morph these guidelines from the American Diabetes Association, the ADA, because they, they, they're the new guidelines that came out in 2017 that they've directed to the primary care docs as far as when to start testing blood sugars. So their guidelines are by patient age, and by patient body mass index. And so if you got a person that's 45 years older, 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 and they live in the United States of America, they're suspicious for getting diabetes. If you're 45 years old or older, period, no matter what race, color, anything, where you live, you are suspicious for developing diabetes in this country. If you have a body mass index above 25, you are suspicious for de developing glaucoma, I mean, uh, diabetes, period. And so in my office now, if you look a certain way, or you got a certain number of birthdays, you get in this test run. Period. You got to raise your hand and say, "Don't do that." You got to. You got to make me not do it. Okay. That's how I've changed my thinking just in the past couple of years. 
Excellent points, and I, and I concur totally with Craig. The strategy in my office specifically around OCT, I run it on everybody, and you, know, can, you can do different sorts of OCT scans and analyses. So if somebody, if I identify with a screening OCT something's wrong, I can then, I know they've got a problem, I can then up the ante, do a more sophisticated scan with 3D registration so I can compare scans in the future, and then it's legitimately justifiably billed to a third party. How many thousands of our colleagues have Optos technology that is billed out of pocket as a screening procedure? And I've, I've consulted at many offices that have Optos technology, it's great technology. Uh, I don't know, I don't have stats on the capture rate, the positive findings, you know, is, is the $39 getting the payback? Are we getting enough benefit for getting that money? I don't know. I do know with OCTA that absolutely uh, it's worth $50 because uh, I may save your life or keep you from going blind. Do you want to spend $50 to let me help you do that, yes or no? You're a good salesman. I like I'm it. I'm good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm real good at it. So let's talk about color vision deficits just for a moment. So the, the, uh, the studies show that 40% of people that have no diabetic retinopathy, when you do a normal clinical exam with a, you know, dilate them, look with the BIO with a fundus lens, 40% of patients with no retinopathy have color vision abnormalities. And these are acquired. These are not hereditary defects. So you're not going to measure them, you know, with, a, with an Ishihara color plate book. You need one of these more sophisticated tests that are basically a combination of a very sensitive color vision analysis combined with a contrast sensitivity test. It's so, almost like a perimeter. It's like a perimeter. It's yeah. like a threshold visual field, but for color sensitivity. And so what we see in diabetes all the time, I mean, I'm seeing this all the time, is selective loss of the short wavelength blue cones. They get damaged early on in diabetes for a number of reasons. There's fewer of them. Hyperglycemia damages S cones more than it does the, the, uh, the other cones. And it's interesting, if you just think about it kind of, you know, in, in, intuitively it makes sense because what do S cones absorb? Blue light. Blue light has higher energy than longer wavelength blue, uh, red and green light. So these cones are selectively kind of destroyed by blue light. So they're already more susceptible to oxidative stress. That's what high blood sugar does. It causes oxidative stress, knocks out these cones earlier on in diabetes than they would have been otherwise. You want to protect those S cones, you want to block out the short wavelength blue light. That's one of the, uh, you know, etiologies it's believed now of age-related macular degeneration is cumulative exposure to blue light. See, the, the big thing I see on this slide, Paul, is 40% of the people with no detectable retinopathy. You, you can't just go by what you see. So what we're seeing here is evidence of neurodegeneration of the retina. This is retinal neurodegeneration producing a functional vision deficit that requires advanced technology to diagnose it. Uh, again, you're not going to get it on Ishihara plates. You're not, you're not going to get it on a D15. You're not. I talked to, I've, I've been lecturing on color vision for five years. Oh, I've got a D15. I got that covered. The D15 was developed in 1949 to test railroad conductors to see if they could see the signal lights. I mean, we're, 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 we're using 80-year-old technology, and they still make optometry students buy this stuff in school. We're using 150-year-old technology to see if someone can see right or not. We have, not, not we have to do better, we are doing better. We just need everybody to get on the train. Uh, you know, I'm on the train, Paul Chouse is on the train. I know lots of people on the train. We need everybody to get on the train, you know. So we've got these great technologies now, the uh, two companies that are producing these contrast color thresholding uh, devices and algorithms, and I would in encourage you to look at it. It reimburses well. I'm not the practice management guru by any stretch. Craig, uh, Craig is much more than I am, but it reimburses well at a fraction of the cost of a, you know, high quality visual field instrument, you know, and it's absolutely beneficial uh, in diabetes. Absolutely. So it's a marker of retinal diabetic uh, neuropathy. Yeah. We just talked about it. Yeah. So how about ERG, Craig? What's the role of ERG in diabetes? Now this is, this ERG is really slick with the diabetes and the diabetic retinopathy, but you have to have the correct testing protocol. Uh, this is a fairly new device. It's been out three or four years. I got one last year. Uh, this is my patient that we're showing on the, on the screen. So the, the difference between this, uh, this handheld ERG, it's called a RET-EVAL, and I say it only because it's the only one available now. You know, if there were competition, I'd have 
pictures of the competitive product, but right now it's the only game in town. Uh, most of us that have electrodiagnostic technology have either the Diopsis technology, uh, which I have, or Conan's technology, which I also have. Uh, this red eval is different than both of them uh, because it elicits the response from the cone bipolar cells, whereas those other two technologies, if you're doing an ERG, almost always it's a pattern ERG where you're evaluating the function of the ganglion cells. And, and ganglion cells can certainly be affected in, in diabetes and diabetic retinopathy, but these other, other types of cells, uh, you know, the, the cones, the, the B wave from the cone bipolar cells, that's what's much more affected in people with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. And you're doing a full field evaluation, you know, where you see how the instrument goes right up on the eye. So it's totally different than, than again, the electrodiagnostics that we have now, where you're looking at a screen 39 inches away. You're, it's a totally different test protocol, looking at the eye in a different way and giving you information on different cell populations than the electrodiagnostics that most of us have. And it's fast and easy to oh, do, God, right? Yes. It's, it's five, five to seven minutes. You know, I've, with, I've with done, I did a seven-year-old that had lost color vision, acquired color vision defect from a fungal medication. Said, Mom and Dad, I can't see colors at all anymore. Had a total color vision abnormality. Ran this test on the patient. Totally depressed ERG. I did a three-year-old two weeks ago with retinitis pigmentosa. Wow. I mean, and the thing was flat. And his daddy had RP, and he brought him in to try to see, you know, th does my son have my eye disease? And I had to, you know, I mean, it was a tough visit. And I had to break it down and said, yes, he does. And I love this test for yeah. suspected uh, malingering uh, children in my practice. Yeah. Uh, it's portable. <laughs> you could go room to room with it. So, again, a strong recommendation that, that uh, even if you have electrodiagnostics now with Diopsis or Conan Technology or, or Diop, it was a, you know, the Diagnosis is a third company that makes them, yeah. that this is different. It's, it's a different test protocol. It's portable, it's fast, and it's good. Uh, strong recommendation. So the, the, Craig already alluded to this. You have a, you have a, a suppressed amplitude on the uh, electroretinogram, and there's a delayed implicit time. That's just essentially, you know, my, my comic book reading of it is that it's how long for the electrical signal from the retina to get back to the instrument. And so it's delayed in diabetes. And the protocol on this particular device was set up specifically to screen for diabetic retinopathy, and it, and it correlates really well. The longer the implicit time, the more likely it is a patient has increasingly severe diabetic retinopathy. Don't have to dilate the pupil. No. I Easy mean, I, to do. If you've got a reasonable number of patients with diabetes in your practice, I could not give a stronger recommendation as far as technology to add. You know, the OCT is the base, but this thing, and, and I'd have to go OCTA, color vision, FDT, ERG. I like, yeah, I like then both. I, then I'd go dark adaptometry. <laughs> you know, if we had a really slick contrast sensitivity test, you know, but if I had to go peck in order, I'd start like that. Maybe we can throw them all in one device at some point, right? That's kind of like the holy grail. My only concern with the all-in-one instruments, you know, there's a, been a push for that, is that if it breaks down, you lose all the you access. You lose everything. You lose everything. And then I'm, then I'm <laughs> stuck with a... Uh, with a cover, a cover paddle, and, a, and I can do a cover <laughs> test and oh, my, get my issue power plates. It, yeah, and even my four after now, you know, depends on uh, electricity going through it. So if I get a power outage, we get a lot of wind storms. Oh, really? I, I'm, I'm, you're out of business. I'm out of business. I got to go back. Yeah, get some trial lenses out. <laughs> <laughs> Handheld Jackson cross cell, right? <laughs> so, so we kind of alluded to this already that, that there's some other really optometry friendly tests like frequency doubling technology, which distinguishes. Uh, problems in diabetes and diabetic retinopathy better than white on white perimetry. And, you know, short wavelength blue on yellow perimetry is also very good for diabetes, but it's a really difficult test for many patients. I like the FDT stimulus. Macular pigment, we know, is reduced in people with diabetes. In fact, if you have low macular pigment, which can be measured in our offices easily, and it's also a possible way to find people at higher risk, not just for diabetes, but for macular degeneration, that you know, you can sell supplements in your office if you choose to do so, and it's another revenue stream potentially. But if you have low macular pigment, your risk of getting diabetic retinopathy is higher. Your risk of getting diabetes is higher. Your risk of Alzheimer's disease, the new studies show, is higher if you have lower macular pigment. So something I think that we ought to be thinking about assessing in our practices. And we've got a couple of different studies now, a couple published in the U.S., a couple in Europe. I was involved with one of them. But basically, it's been shown that if you add a, uh, a xanthophyll 
carotenoid, lutein, or zeaxanthin, and I assume mesozeaxanthin as well, you can improve visual function in people that have diabetes as well as diabetic retinopathy. So again, this just speaks to what I just talked to. And this, is, this device now, I don't believe, is actually being manufactured in the United States. Technology was sold to another company, but there's a couple of players in the market now that are doing macular pigment testing. It's easy to do. It provides you a way to identify people at higher risk for disease. And it also allows you a way to measure improvements if people change their diet, eat more of the lutein, zeaxanthin-rich foods, right? The dark, leafy greens that we tell all of our patients to eat now, right? You can, or you can supplement. You can get patients back into your office and demonstrate to them and yourself that you've actually been able to improve their score. And I think that's a really uh, great thing for those of us who see a lot of patients with diabetes. So what are our treatment and management goals? Well, first of all, we want to keep people from getting diabetes if we can, or at least push it into the future. The diabetes prevention program showed us we can do that. We can't cure you know, diabetes necessarily uh, by walking, but if you have pre-diabetes and you walk, you can dramatically cut your risk of getting diabetes in the near term. Now, over 20 years, most of these people with pre-diabetes convert, but you can prolong the interval between pre-diabetes and diabetes by simply walking 30 minutes a day, at least five days a week. And the more you walk, <laughs> the better the odds, and the older you are, the better your, your odds. So if you're 70, pre-diabetes and you walk 30 minutes a day, your odds are dramatically better at preventing diabetes than they are if you're 30 and do the same thing. The second goal is to delay the development of diabetic retinopathy, to arrest or slow the worsening of the retinopathy, and of course, refer patients for treatment when they get sight-threatening disease. So proliferative retinopathy or center-involved diabetic macular edema. You know, I studied political theory, Craig, before I became an optometrist. I have a master's degree in political science, I know. It goes perfectly for, <laughs> for my discussions with my patients these days. But I love this one quote from Karl Marx who said, you know, the philosophers have only interpreted the world, really the point of what we do as a philosopher or as a scientist or a clinician is to try to change the way things are, to make them better. And I really think that's what the American you know, experience is about, is making the future better for our children than it was for us. So the first thing we know is that controlling blood glucose more intensively and blood pressure also, to a large extent, lowers the risk of microvascular complications dramatically, both in the short run and the long run. In both type 1 and type 2 diabetes patients, lowering the average blood sugar lowers the risk. It's not perfect, but it lowers the risk. In a couple of studies, short term, it lowered the risk also of some cardiovascular problems, but long term now the mantra is don't drive people's blood glucose too low because you actually increase their risk of dying. Really? So in older patients with pre-existing heart disease, if you try to drive their A1C much below 7, they are much more likely, 20% more likely, to have a fatal event, so like a heart attack. And the thought is that the heart gets conditioned to a certain level of glucose, and if you cut off the glucose supply, the heart's already ischemic, you maybe provoke an event. And that's what we've got to, we've got to be careful about. Not every patient needs an A1C of, you know, six or five, right? Just like every glaucoma patient doesn't need a pressure of 10. It's exactly the same thing. It's yeah. individualization of care. That's an, just a fabulous analogy. So I ask this rhetorical question because I think this will surprise a lot of our colleagues, Greg. You know, is hemoglobin A1C the best predictor? of your risk of getting diabetic retinopathy or losing your vision. So we know that A1C is important, as is how long you've had diabetes. But if you look at the research, and th these are studies done in people with type 1 diabetes, long-term follow-up, 40-year follow-up now, it's been shown that the mean A1C, so the average of the average, that's all an A1C is, is the three-month average of your blood sugar levels by measuring how much glucose is stuck to your red blood cells as they die, die off in about 90 days. So if you look at the average of the A1C over time, that doesn't predict diabetic retinopathy all that well. It only accounts for somewhere between 6 and 11% of the total risk. So that begs the question, well, what is the majority of the risk? So there's a whole bunch of research now going on with endocrinology trying to determine what other aspects of blood glucose, other than just the average, determines whether or not patients develop retinopathy and really severe retinopathy. I thought time was the biggest thing. Time is actually the biggest risk factor. Yeah. 
But there are some other features we're going to talk about of glycemia, of blood glucose, that appear to be maybe more predictive. The, the other thing that argues against the A1C being the, you know, the gold standard is this Joslin gold medalist study. So these are people with type 1 diabetes for 50 years or longer. Another misspelling, Craig just pointed out to me, the gold medalist. Yeah, so I did. I, went, I actually went to high school. So, so the, uh, the uh, gold medalist study showed that after 50 years... A1C had very little correlation with those who did and didn't develop severe diabetic retinopathy. Very low correlation. So are there protective factors? Probably. There's probably all sorts of genetic you know, polymorphisms of our genes that determine you know, whether or not we get a whole host of diseases. There's no one gene that determines diabetic retinopathy. It doesn't appear. But some people have protection against it. It's, A1C is not the predominant risk factor. It appears in long-term diabetes. So here's one thing that maybe increases the risk. This is an ARVO poster presented this year. Really not enough patients to have any long-term conclusions, but they did continuous glucose monitoring uh, with a device that measures your blood sugar minute by minute, uh, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And what they showed was that if your blood glucose levels get above 400, the risk of developing severe diabetic retinopathy went way up. It didn't happen when the blood glucose levels were above 350 or 250, but on average, people that had more spikes above 400 were way more likely to develop severe retinopathy compared to those that had fewer spikes. So just so, so the bottom line here is don't let your blood glucose get above 400. Try to minimize that, and that's, that's an easy bar for many patients, but for others, you know, if a patient comes in and their A1C is 13, they've got an average blood sugar of 400. So their average is 400, so that tells you they're probably way higher than that often. What's the highest you've ever seen? So I've had patients come in and tell me at diagnosis they were 1,400 and were in a coma. I was 1,100 at diagnosis at Kaiser Permanente in Los Angeles, and uh, they diagnosed me with influenza, interestingly, and uh, I went into a uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, ended up in the hospital for about a week. But, you know, patients function when their blood glucose is six, 700. Yeah, I've seen a 900. Yeah, then they get pretty crap. Yeah. They get pretty crabby. We put them in the um, hospital. I have one of these CGMs now, on now, and I was just showing Craig that I'm 178 now, so shame on me, but I'm going down. These CGMs are really remarkable devices. They basically a continuous glucose monitor. They're wearable. They've got ones that are going to be on your wristwatch shortly, and they can not only predict whether or not you know, your blood sugar is high or low if you have diabetes, they actually predict whether or not you've got diabetes by measuring heart rate variability now. They can also diagnose sleep apnea and hypertension as well as arrhythmia using these wearable sensors. I think this is going to be a huge growth area in healthcare in the next 10 years. Here's a really interesting study done in rats. Okay, it's not humans. Most of my patients aren't rats. A few of them are. But what, what was shown in this rat model was that if your blood sugar remains elevated above about 190 for six hours or longer, not less. Six hours was the minimum. For the next several weeks, there was a massive increase in inflammation within the retina, and it led to the pathways biochemically that we know with certainty cause diabetic retinopathy. So these super high reactive oxygen species last for two weeks. And these are animals that their blood sugar is jacked up for six hours, and then they're given intravenous insulin, so their blood sugar immediately drops down to a normal level, let's say 90. And they still, for the next two weeks, have massive production of reactive oxygen species, free radicals, that are the underlying cause of diabetic-related vascular damage. So these excursions, we call them now, blood sugars out of the normal range that are short-term, six hours is not that long. In the, in the span of three months, which is a hemoglobin A1C, it's not going to really be reflected. So this is the thought now is that, well, only 11% of the total risk is your A1C. Maybe a big part of the risk are these short-term spikes in blood sugar that last six hours or longer. They're not reflected in the A1C, but they dramatically increase inflammation within the retina. So my strategy for my patients now, don't let your blood sugar ever get above 400 if possible. And if you get above 190, get it down as quickly as possible. Well, how do you do that? Well, you stop eating the cheeseburger or the cheesecake as the case may be, but there are some actually other practical strategies for this. We need more research in humans, clearly. You want to optimize your A1C, minimize the duration of hyperglycemia above 190. So I already talked about that. So what can you do? So these are the things you can do. 
if you're on insulin, subcutaneous insulin, whether it's a pump or through an injection, takes a long time to actually start working. A way to speed it up is by inhaling it. There's a product in the upper middle box there called Afrezza that's inhalable insulin, drives your blood sugar down in about one third the time. The other effective strategy is to do a intramuscular injection of insulin. IM injections work faster, cuts the weight to get your blood sugar down in half compared to a subcutaneous injection. Was I ever taught this? No. I read this at, you know, kind of one of these user groups for people with diabetes from shared experiences. So if your doctor doesn't tell you this, your doctor doesn't tell you the full story. The other way to try to get it lower is by having a continuous glucose monitor, which is depicted here. The sensor is in the middle of the screen. The monitor is on the right. You see the 120, so that's a good number. Is this patient in trouble? Yes, they're in severe jeopardy. And why? See the double arrows above the 120? That means the blood glucose is dropping straight down really fast. So this patient's on the way towards severe hypoglycemia. And I'll tell you, Craig, living with diabetes 50 years, the thing that scares me the most in the short run is not high blood sugar, it's low blood sugar. Well, you would pass out? You pass out, you can go into, you know, uh, into convulsions, you can crash your automobile, you can't do your job, you can't have sex when your blood sugar is low. So that ruins quality of life, right? So I think people with diabetes make a rational decision, a rational decision to let their blood glucoses remain elevated. Why? Because patients, especially on insulin, or on sulfonylurea drugs like galiburide or glipizide, they're afraid of low blood sugars because it ruins your quality of life in the short run. Now, long run, high blood sugar is bad for you, but people live in the here and now, and I think they make a rational decision, which we have to do as healthcare providers just to let them know, if you drive your car at 120 miles an hour on a straightaway for a long time, you'll be okay, but the minute the road curves, you're in trouble. You're heading towards a curve in the road, and if you let your blood sugars chronically remain elevated, there's going to be nothing but you know, disaster down the road likely. So I just wanted to make that point. Be sympathetic with your patients, especially when they're on insulin. There is a real reason that patients let their blood sugars remain high. And the goal is to not let it remain too high for too long. There's some new technologies that help with this that I'll mention on the next slide. But I wanted to mention this last thing, which is taking a walk. So if you walk at least 10 minutes after you eat the largest meal of the day, in this case, it was the, the dinner, it reduces your blood sugar much better right after the meal than does walking any other time of the day for longer, for half an hour. So I'm encouraging now all my patients after their largest meal of the day to take a 10 minute walk because that makes you more insulin sensitive, whether you're on insulin therapy or not, lowers your blood sugar faster, reduces these post meal spikes in blood sugar levels. Would this be for patients that are under good control to? To take a walk? Yes. So that anybody with diabetes. Anybody with diabetes can do just, it. Just that's a long, recommendation. As long as they don't have, you know, blown, blown joints that yeah, prevent yeah. them from doing it. And I've had patients coming in with, you know, amputations and the like, missing lower limbs, they can't walk. You know, so an exercise bike, uh, they have exercise bicycles for your arms that I've seen at meetings where. So, so it's just the activity. Yeah, it's just, it's movement of your yeah, body. The okay. more, the better. That's the idea. So here's a new insulin pump that just came out in, uh, in January of this year. Medtronic makes it. I don't have any relationship with them. I wear a different company's device. But the 670G, what the, so most insulin pumps give you insulin, and they can give you more or less depending on the time of day. They're programmed. But they don't know whether your blood sugar is high or low. You can measure your blood sugar or wear a sensor, which is on the left here on this person's abdomen, but the two don't talk to each other until now. So this continuous glucose sensor is linked to the insulin pump. So if your blood sugar is dropping rapidly, like the previous slide, it'll back off on the amount of insulin you're getting. These pumps constantly deliver insulin to your body. On the other hand, if your blood sugar is rising rapidly, they'll give you more insulin to try to get it under control. So what the studies show is that patients stay in a good range, which is kind of defined as 100 to 160, a lot higher percentage of the time wearing this new pump. And these things are only going to get better as time goes by. I just saw a new pump at a, at a trade show for diabetes that has not only insulin in it, but glucagon, which is basically a stored form of sugar, so that if you're really dropping low, it can give you an extra boost of sugar through the pump, mm. glucagon, and jack, jack your blood sugar levels back up. <laughs> so these technologies are evolving. There's going to be a an external pancreas for people with type 1 diabetes that's on the market that's effectively going to be a cure 
very shortly, I believe, although I was told, you know, 40 years ago, oh, a cure is right around the corner, and here it is, you know, 40 years later, no cure. So what's another way to battle these glucose spikes? Another way to do it is using a very dirt cheap technology known as apple cider vinegar. So vinegar blocks starch digestion in your gut. So basically there are drugs like meglitonide and Starlix that are available, Prandin. These are drugs that are amylase inhibitors. They prevent the breakdown of starches in the gut, but they give you a lot of gas. So patients don't like them. Vinegar does the exact same thing. So here's evidence that just shows if you take two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar before you eat, it lowers how much your blood sugar levels go up by about 20%. So the AUC is the area under the curve. The blood glucose curve over a period of time was reduced 20%. That means less spiking and faster return to a more normal level. Paul, if you had a person that, that had a two ounce, the two tablespoon shot of apple cider vinegar before the meal and then took the 10 minute walk after the meal, would the blood sugar go down 40%? It very well might. The study hasn't been done, but I like it. And that's something that I mean, is we... That, is it a cumulative or, or additive it thing? It should be a totally additive effect because they're working by different mechanisms. This is blocking See, starch. I mean, that's, that's two easy things that we could tell almost every patient with diabetes. So I put this on a handout. Everything I'm saying now, I put on a handout for my patients. I hand it to them. And every year I talk, did you read the handout? No. And sometimes patients get overwhelmed. So what I do, I suspect you do this, is I circle the one or two most important things, I think, on that list of recommendations, and I say, look, focus on well, this. But to me, that's, here's the two. You got, you got one before you eat, one after you eat. If you do this, you got a 30 40% drop in, in blood sugar. Man, I think people would buy into that. They would. And yes. so their PCP is probably not talking to them about this all that much. You know, what patients with type 2 diabetes are typically told is exercise more, lose weight. But this is easy and it's specific. <laughs> yes. Ease. And effective based on the study. Ease and specificity are what you want, right? Yes. It, it's, it's easy to tell people what to do. You really See, need I mean, to I hold their hand. I could almost sell apple cider vinegar out of my office like I do nutraceuticals. Dr. Thomas's, you know, elixir is what I'd put on it. There you go. Diabetes there elixir. You go. We just got to be careful about the medical claims we make, but I think... I, I'm claiming it's apple cider it's vinegar. It's apple cider vinegar is the claim. <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> yeah, I like it. Here, so here's a new insulin that just came to market March 1st. So it's Novolog, which is... You know, thought to be a fast-acting insulin, this works twice as fast because they added something called niacinamide to the insulin, and it makes the insulin work much faster. It's more bioavailable. So at an hour after a test meal of a certain number of carbohydrates, the blood sugar is about 30 points lower with this new insulin. And that's important because, again, we want to prevent the spikes. In the UK, this is the only allowed insulin on the formulary in the United Kingdom now because they did a, an econometrics analysis and they said with a 0.15% drop in hemoglobin A1C, which is what this, this type of insulin allows, that's a 1% drop in blindness caused by diabetes throughout the UK. So they figure the cost is no more. Let's put everybody on this because that's a, a you know, public health savings to, to all of us. The, this insulin doesn't cost any more money. There is a downside that I just discovered personally, which is it stings a little bit when you inject it. It's not approved for use in a pump yet either, but just something. So the FIAS, where, do, where does that come from? Fast acting insulin aspart. Insulin aspart is Novo Log. Again, I don't work for, for Novo Nordis, but that's their insulin. Here's another important thing that most physicians just aren't aware of. And I was at an NIH diabet diabetic retinopathy meeting last year, and we talked about this extensively. In Australia, phenofibrate, which is a drug widely used to treat high triglycerides, if you put patients on phenofibrate, they're way less likely to develop site-threatening diabetic retinopathy. That's the bottom line here. So in Australia now, if you have any diabetic retinopathy and you're an adult with type 2 diabetes, you're automatically put on phenofibrate as first-line therapy. So it's about 100 milligrams of phenofibrate a day. It goes by various names. Tricor is probably the most common. Here's the big deal, I think. You only need to treat 14 patients to prevent one case of clinically significant diabetic macular edema or one case of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. That's a pretty low number needed to treat. How many people do you have to treat with a statin, Craig, to prevent a single heart attack? Well, it's more than 14. It, it, it's, it's like 70 to 150, <laughs> yeah. depending on the patient's risk factors. So this is an excellent number needed to treat. 
So it decreases all these inflammatory proteins that have been linked to diabetic retinopathy, lowers your cholesterol. The only downside, it can cause rhabdomyolysis, right? So the, the muscle cramping and pain if you're also on a high dose statin. So the, if you combine it with Lipitor or uh, Crestor, the odds of that happening are much higher than if you use Pravastatin. And the reason is Pravastatin doesn't lower your LDL as effectively. But, you know, you can add phenofibrate to a, a less, uh, a less uh, uh, efficacious, less potent statin, lower the risk of getting rhabdo and getting the muscle problems, and also protect the patient's eyes. So again, primary care physicians freak out about this. Endocrinologists, not as much. Cardiologists love this stuff. They use trichor left and right to prevent cardiovascular compromise. I thought this was interesting using alpha-GAN and somatostatin, which is a uh, growth hormone inhibitor. They use it to treat uh, acromegaly and gigantism caused by pituitary adenomas that hypersecrete uh, growth hormone. But an eye drop version of this was shown to prevent retinal diabetic uh, neurodegeneration in, in this one study, a combined eye drop used twice a day. And they, they measured the retinal neurodegeneration using a multifocal uh, ERG. And this is a consortium in Europe that's trying to repurpose uh, inexpensive drugs and turn them into treatments for diabetic retinopathy. So will this come to the US? I don't know. But you know, it, 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 some demonstration of benefit in this clinical trial. If the pharmaceutical companies can make money, it will come to the United if States. If they can make money, yeah. If you, yes. so, so, you know, the question will be, okay, so it helps the MFERG. Long term, does it lower the likelihood of blindness? Because that's what insurance companies care about. How many people need bypass surgery, because that's expensive? Another misspelling, faux. Faux two years, my top line, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, will, it, will, it prevent, will it prevent cardiovascular revascularization procedures, bypass operations? Will it prevent end-stage renal disease that requires dialysis? And will it prevent blindness? Because those are the three big things in diabetes. Amputations is the other one. They cost a lot of money. So if we can show that it does, it'll probably get covered. This is my research. I'm sorry, Craig, I'm hogging the podium here. No, no it's but, all good. You know, the, this is my research. It's five years of my life spent on this endeavor, the Diabetes Visual Function Supplement Study. It was a six-month randomized controlled clinical trial. We measured visual function in people with diabetes, some of whom had no retinopathy, some who had mild stage non-proliferative disease. And we did all these functional studies. We measured C-reactive protein and their blood lipids and their A1C, did you know, perimetry and color vision and macular pigment and their contrast sensitivity function was measured. And we wanted to see if we could put a bunch of stuff in a single capsule and impact patient's visual function. So this was what was in the test formula. A lot of these things you'll recognize because they overlap with AMD type supplements, you know, uh, like ARIDS too. But there's some novel things in here that in animal models have been shown to completely prevent diabetic retinopathy from occurring even when blood sugar levels are really high. And this is the result. So the bottom line is here, the p-values, if you're under 0.05, generally it's thought to be you know, statistically significant. So basically the bottom line is that every measure of visual function we did dramatically improved in patients before and after. Some were on placebo, some weren't. It improved dramatically in people on the test formula. It's a six-month duration. It's a six-month duration, and we're following some of these patients now. I've got some patients out to two years, and the visual function benefits seem to continue on. Really? It's only 67 patients. That's the problem. You know, we need you know, more than that, obviously. But the one that really got my attention, there's two things here. One is C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory protein in the blood that predicts diabetic macular edema, as well as the risk of dying from a heart attack or a stroke. So CRP levels were cut in half in people taking the supplement. That was a surprising finding that we kind of threw in at the last minute because we wanted some more blood markers. The other important thing is that it had no effect on the hemoglobin A1C. So you're not interfering with the treatment regimen of the endocrinologist or the PCP by giving patients this supplement because you're not affecting their blood glucose levels. We had no adverse events in the trial. And uh, the other thing at the bottom there, DPNNS, DPNSS is Diabetic Peripheral Neuropathy Score. And so we had people in the study that had really bad symptoms of, as you said earlier, do you have numbness, ting tingling, burning in your feet and toes? So people that were on the formula reported a statistically significant 
improvement in their diabetic neuropathy symptoms. So we thought that that you know, was, a, was, an, it was a big deal potentially as well. In an animal model, because we ran this concurrently, the formula basically prevented diabetic retinopathy. And these animals had blood glucose levels of about 1,000 during the study, so a little higher than most of our patients on average. And they threw this formula into the rat chow in some of the animals and not in others. And at the end of the uh, trial, the animals were euthanized, looked at the mitochondrial DNA, the level of oxidative stress, capillary cell apoptosis, right, death. That's the underpinning anatomically of diabetic retinopathy. It was cut down. VEGF levels, right, that's what we're injecting people with Avastin and Lucentis for, went, went way down. And so, you know, we think that we're actually interfering with the mechanisms underlying diabetic retinopathy without affecting blood glucose or blood pressure whatsoever. And, and Paul, I'd like to toss my personal experience with this Diphos formula. I've been uh, prescribing it to patients for probably eight or nine months now. Uh, again, I'm reasonably skilled at getting people to do stuff that I want them to do, but it's easy to do that when you believe in it and you've got science that backs you up. And I have had tremendous uh, acceptance of this in my practice, and most of us have already gone into the, the nutraceutical realm with treating ocular surface disease with the omega-3 fatty acids. We've gone into the macular degeneration realm with, with the antioxidants, the zoot, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Zeolutine. and Lutein. <laughs> and, and, yeah. we, we've been talking all day. <laughs> and, and so it's not a new thing for us as optometrists to explain disease processes to our patients and recommend non-medicine type products. And you're not treating their diabetes. Yes. You're treating their eyes. And, and you're the, preventing and, problems. And the, the, the point I wanted to make <clears throat> is that I explained to the patient that we're going to run a parallel course with their internist. I don't communicate with the internist. I don't tell them what I'm finding, other than if there's some retinopathy. Uh, I don't tell them what I'm doing. Uh, I ask the patient, are you taking any vitamins, because I don't want to duplicate stuff or overdose them. Uh, but I do not interact with the medical doctor when I prescribe nutraceuticals for diabetes, just like I don't with, with macular degen or ocular surface disease. Uh, all it's going to do is confuse the medical doctor, uh, you're going to take the risk of putting the patient between that doctor and you. Uh, the patient generally going to choose the medical doctor when they're put in that position. Uh, just, just explain we're going to run a parallel course. This is not going to affect anything that your primary care doctor is doing. It's not going to affect you taking insulin. It's not going to affect you taking metformin. It's going to run a parallel course, and one is not going to affect the other. I'm going to work as hard as I can to keep you from going blind. That's why we're doing this. Is that okay with you, yes or no? And by the time I finish, they always say yes. So I've, been, I've had really, really, really good results, good acceptance. I haven't done it long enough to start retesting a bunch of people to, to see if they're actually getting better with their visual function test. But based on your research and, and just the science that I know, I'm expecting that it's what's gonna happen and they're gonna get better. Some of them may get a little better, some may get a lot better, but generally speaking, they're gonna get better or at least maybe not get any worse as fast. You know, I might get them better. If I can't get them better, maybe I can slow down the negative. Do no harm. We're not going to harm anybody with this particular formula unless you have an allergic reaction to something which, you know, the most likely component might be the fish oil. So obviously if you have a fish oil, a fish allergy, you're going to avoid it. And, you know, it, people, so I, you know, I did this, I have bias because I did the study. It, published in British Journal of Ophthalmology, peer-reviewed journal, which is a good thing. It was hard as hell to, uh, to do the research. I have total newfound respect for researchers after working work. on this. It's a lot it's of work. It's a lot of work. A lot of work. Uh, you, the formula is available now through uh, I Promise. They have a supplement that is a mimic of what we used in the study called I Promise DVS. DVS. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another company that also has a diabetes specific type uh, formula. There is, and I think, yeah. you know, look at what's in it, look at the components, look at the dosages, and, you know, we're doctors. We can make edge. You can recommend the individual components to your patients, and that would be just just as good except from a convenience standpoint. It's just, you know, we talked about at the beginning of the, of the lecture, you know, what can we do? This is what I can do. Uh, you know, we, we all can talk to our patients. But, you know, we can do more than that. You know, I mean, I could pick up a bottle and say, this is my recommendation. I think this will help you. Please take this, this product. And, and say it with confidence and integrity. 
Uh, so our, our whole message here is that, you know, you need to be looking more closely for the effects of diabetes on the eyes other than looking for red stuff in the eye, bleeding and neovascularization and the like. We, there's a lot of other technologies that can be used. Really, the bottom line for me is we can do more than just simply tell patients, come back in a year, take you know, better care of your diabetes if you're not. Get, or, some, get some diet and exercise. Yeah, get some diet and exercise. We can be more, <laughs> more specificity, I think, is key. And if we can prevent diabetes, we're primary care providers, that's the best way to prevent blindness caused by diabetes or any visual loss caused by diabetes. So I think this is the last slide. This is the slide that often patients uh, like to see. I have this basically printed out on a handout, and I show this to, to docs when I'm talking about diabetes. This is all evidence-based. Uh, advice to prevent getting diabetes in the first place. And, you know, you can look at this and go through and you can look at the citations that show there is some benefit. Some of them may be surprising and others maybe not so much. So things like eating more vegetables, a good idea. I think, you know, the, Craig and I were joking about this earlier, breastfeeding dramatically lowers a woman's risk of developing type 2 diabetes, especially if she had gestational diabetes. And there is a dose-response relationship. So the longer you breastfeed, the lower the risk, right? Well, the, I, I gave a similar lecture a, a month ago in Texas, and all of my guys kept asking me, is that good for the guy too? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, you may, you may have to pay some psychiatric uh, <laughs> expenses, you know, if, if, if you breastfeed your child to 29, but, you know, it, it'll be good for preventing diabetes. So you can look at the various things that are on the slide there. And, you know, uh, Craig and I are just grateful that you hung out with us today. Uh, this is, my, I, I was going to finish on this last case. Well, also, I'll, I'll, I'll go over the time by two minutes. So this was my best friend from junior high. So he came in and he said, Paul, I found you on the Internet. He lives about four hours away in Portland, Oregon. I'm in Tacoma, Washington. And he said, I heard you know a lot about diabetes. I read your, your, your cu curriculum vitae. And he was a large man when I saw him. I hadn't seen him in, you know, 40 years. And he said, I want to, to kill myself. That, those were the words out of his mouth. And I said, okay, well, you're here. You don't want to kill yourself. You came, you sought me out. Let's talk about it. And his, the major reason was he got diabetes. They put him on an oral agent. Didn't work effectively to lower his blood sugar. Not effectively enough. They put him on insulin. What does insulin do? It makes you gain weight. So he became more obese. He got erectile dysfunction. And he said, my quality of life is just awful. I don't want to go on. So what I talked to him about was a protocol that I was introduced to by a fellow optometrist. And I wish that I knew his name. I don't. I, I spoke in Denver, Colorado five years ago. And he said, hey, you ought to check out these videos by Jason Fung, F-U-N-G. He's a kidney specialist in Toronto. Fung's whole protocol is don't eat every day. <laughs> eat every other day. Drink water on the days you don't eat. Eat a paleo diet on the days you eat. And do this if you're 30 pounds or more above ideal body weight. So I said to my friend, PK, let's try this. Before you, know, you take your life, my friend, let's, let's try this. And he came back six months later, had lost 35 pounds. His BMI now, he was borderline obese. His A1C was normal. He's off of insulin. And he told me, you know, I've got my groove back, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so he threw his arms around me and started crying. I broke down. I was verklempt for the rest of my, you know, afternoon. Talk amongst yourselves. It just made me realize, <laughs> you know, that we can impact patients' quality of lives profoundly, not just directly by intervening in their eye problems, but by actually changing the quality of their life. It was a pretty simple thing I did. And I want to encourage all of us to talk to our patients that are especially morbidly obese about using fasting as an option. Not everybody's going to be able to do it, but if even a small percent do it, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. He told me this was the best thing I've ever done. And we went out and uh, I think we ate a pizza and drank some beer together, <laughs> kind of in celebration. I think we should be on the diabetes care team because we are gatekeepers in diabetes care and we're primary care providers, right? And our our communities need us, our profession needs us, our nation needs us to try to stem the tide. Craig, I can't thank you enough for spending the last multiple hours with me today. I'm grateful. I hope you enjoyed our talk. I'm grateful to the audience. Thanks, everybody. I had a good time. Hope you learned something.